Just look at what God can do. What more evidence do we need to believe the two stories we've just heard today? To believe and trust, as Paul will say in Ephesians, that God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ever ask or imagine. Now that's a great promise, but maybe you're like me. You wonder if you can really believe God or believe God is that powerful. It's certainly been quite a demanding season, a demanding year, year and a half. A pandemic that has put that promise to a test. We want to ask and cry out, God, if you're so able, why has it been such a struggle for all of us? Why have so many gotten sick, so many died? There's so much loss, so much polarization within us and around us. We continue to be stretched and challenged personally with our own concerns for our health, worries about the future. As a faith family, we have disagreed about how to safely worship together and be the church. As a local community, we debate about how best to care for our children and teach them in schools. As a nation, we quarrel among ourselves. As a national partner on a vulnerable planet, we just can't get along with each other. These verses of Scripture are easy at times to say, but harder to live and even harder to put them in practice. Today we look at the two eyewitnesses we have who must have also doubted in God's power, and yet they took a leap of faith. Can we do the same right now? We've lost their names, but we know their stories. One is a farmer from Bael Shalisha, and we follow him on his way to worship. It's Stewardship Sunday, and he wondered about cutting back just a little bit this year. It's been a hard year for him. There's been a drought in his nation. There's a poor harvest. Those around him are struggling. His family doesn't know what to do. If resources were in the stock market, we would say they would have plummeted. Little hope for rain on the horizon or a better year ahead. And yet he comes to worship. In the midst of such hardship and uncertainty, some of us would have been tempted to stay away, to pout and complain, or be tempted to save a little bit more for ourselves. We don't know what the future will bring. Yet not knowing what was ahead, this farmer takes from his grain fields enough barley to bake 20 loaves of bread. And he fills them in a sack, and he takes this to the man of God, the prophet Elisha. Now, barley is a grain similar to wheat, but when we read about it in the Bible, it's an inferior grain, and most often we hear about used, being used to feed animals or the poor people who couldn't afford anything else. The farmer takes these gifts as his first fruit, as his thank offering to God, as his pledge of stewardship commitment, and he gives it to Elisha. Just ponder that gift. In the midst of a famine, of economic crises, not only does he come to worship, but he brings the first fruits, his offering to God, the tithe of his income, the very best that he has, ha has. We almost want to say, hold off, don't do it yet. This isn't a good plan. You don't know what's going to happen. This isn't a wise decision for your wealth management portfolio. And with his offering, remember it's 20 loaves of bread. Elijah tells him to open up the sack and give the, fee the food to the poor so they can eat. Even Elisha's servant is stunned. Look around us. We have at least 100 people. 20 loaves will not go anywhere. There'll be a panic for those few slices of bread and the crumbs. How can I set this small amount before all these people? But Elisha, the prophet of God, insists, now just watch. Just watch and see what God can do. And amazingly, everyone ate. They had enough. They were fed, and there were even leftovers to gather and share. Wow, that story seems amazing. And yet, in so many ways, it's small potatoes compared to the New Testament story that we know best in John's gospel. Why is it, I wonder, the gospel writers tell a similar story six times in the New Testament? That's more than we hear about the birth story of Jesus. I wonder why it's so important for us to hear this story. Remember those on the Galilean hillside that day would have also known that story. They would have remembered the story by Elisha and the man with 20 loaves of barley bread. And today we watch as a young boy has curiously been following the teacher named Jesus. They've watched him heal people. They've heard his lessons. Jesus crosses over to the Sea of Tiberias 
And like others in the crowd, the boy and the crowd just follow around the edges. They are hungry, hungry to hear more from Jesus, to learn more. But it's getting late, and even the boy is hungry, and even the people around him. He's glad he squirreled away a little bit of a lunch, a snack, for his day's travels. He watches as a teacher named Jesus asks the disciples, how are we to buy bread for so many? Philip says, I don't think it's our problem. I don't think they planned well. We didn't ask them to come. We didn't ask them to keep following us. They should have known better, planned better. What are we to do? I think we don't need to do anything. We certainly can't feed them all. If we were rich, and Jesus, we're not rich, it would take at least six months of paychecks just to buy bread for these people. Well, look around. There must be more than 5,000 hungry people here. That must be when the young boy tugged on Andrew's sleeve. Andrew seemed like one of the younger disciples and maybe someone who seemed kind. And the boy says, hey, mister, you can have my lunch. And he hands a greasy sack with two dried fish and five cold biscuits made out of barley. It's a wonder Andrew even mentioned this pitiful lunch to Jesus. It looks like it's been shoved inside a boy's pocket all day long. Andrew reports, there's a boy here. He's got five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that among so many? Aren't we all there with Andrew and Philip evaluating the cost, counting our resources, looking at how much we need for other things, the demands, calculating our need with a church budget for next year? What can we do when the need is so great and we have so little? Yet instead of giving up, Jesus uses this moment to test the disciples. What's he testing for? To challenge and stretch their faith and to show the power of God. Could God be using this same moment in our times to challenge us? What might we be learning? What could we be learning about God's power and our faith if we're willing to share? So Jesus welcomes the small lunch. He doesn't even snicker as he lifts that cold, small barley loaf and blesses it, breaks it, thanks to God, and gives it to the 5,000 men, along with the women and children seated on the grassy hillside. And they eat, and they eat. They pass the baskets from one to the other. They take out a piece of fish, and they pass it to the other. The next person pulls out some bread, and so it continues until all are fed. Each person was filled with more than just that bread and fish. They were filled with the wonder and awe of this miracle that they were a part of, that they were experiencing before their very eyes. This amazing power of Jesus, greater than even the prophet Elisha. Remember, he fed 100 men, Jesus felt 5,000. Elijah had 20 loaves of bread, Jesus had five barley loaves and 12 baskets of leftovers. So why don't we get it? What keeps us from believing that God will do what God says? What makes us afraid of running out? So much so that we clutch even tighter what we falsely believe is ours. Our money, our resources, our time. We know at times our possessions really do possess us. We have believe the bad news that there is not enough of things. And if we don't grab tightly, to our stuff and clutch it, there'll not be enough. The shortages during the pandemic have filled us all with a sense of fear. We already had that fear, but it's intensified that of not having enough. Remember the toilet paper, the vaccines, computer chips now, we don't have enough Halloween costumes, and we're panicking over Christmas gifts. What we learn from these two eyewitnesses is that God's abundance is seen and experienced when we are faithful in our stewardship and hospitality. When we grow in our grace and gratitude instead of retreating and holding tightly to what we believe is ours. Remember that verse? God works through us by God's power at work within us to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ever ask or imagine. Consider that farmer from Baal Shalisha. In spite of the famine that was going around him, his uncertain future, he gives thanks to God, and he gives his first fruits to God. 
He doesn't know if there will be any second fruits. This may be his entire harvest that he gives away. But he knows that those barley loaves, those sacks of grain, belong to God, not to him. And God is able through him to accomplish far more than he can ask or imagine. The little boy gave his lunch. He refused to believe that he could not make a difference in the world. Even if his lunch is small, he refused to believe that it's an impossible task to make a difference, to feed the hungry one. Instead, he responds with all that he has. Maybe that's why Jesus says we must become like children who in their generosity and gratitude believe and trust that they can make a difference and they trust that God can do great things. We respond with gratitude as stewards of all that God has entrusted with us to care and nurture, from our money to our God-given talents to our gifts of time, our gift of retirement years, our health. And what do we do with those gifts God has entrusted to us? We can choose to use them all for ourselves, to share them with our family and our enjoyment, or we can choose to share them in acts of hospitality and compassion. We can feed those who are hungry. Even when it seems like all we're adding is a drop in the bucket, it is God's drop of mercy. And God promises to accomplish through us far more than we can ask or imagine. Someone can move into a house who's never had a home before through Love, Inc. and the Houses of Hope right down East Dairy Road, providing a family with a year's time of opportunity to find a better lodging. They can receive a lunch at Downtown Bradley Bread this morning and maybe receive a gift of hope. They can get health care through free clinics. We can stand back and watch what God can do with our two ingredients of grace and gratitude. What is next for God to do through us here at Dairy Church if we offer and trust God our gratitude, our stewardship, our first fruits, and our willingness to reach out in compassion. Just imagine what God can do in our world if we could trust and give. God could do far more than we can even in our wildest dreams imagine. Your gifts and my gifts, no matter how small and how meager they seem, make a difference. What's in your lunch bag, in your wallet, in your bank account? in your life? Can you share with God in gratitude? Can you accomplish far more than you and I can even imagine? Whatever your gift of time, maybe it's a gift of time to rake leaves at the church or to sing in the choir or to teach a Sunday school class or to offer prayers for those in need. Your gift, my gift, when they are given to God, multiply incredibly. Can you picture that small boy still standing wide-eyed. Now he's holding his empty lunch bag, just wondering what in the name of God had just happened. Maybe others had seen the boy hand his lunch to Andrew, and they said, you know, I brought a little snack myself. I'll offer it as well. And before you know it, the greater miracle, it's not that all these people were fed, but maybe that so many of them shared and gave what they had. And Jesus shows us what happens when we open our hearts in gratitude and generosity and compassion. You've already received that stewardship pledge card, that estimate of what you were planning to give to God through dairy for you and your family to consider. Just imagine what God can do with my gift and your gift in God's name. More than you and I can imagine. We can build a school in Pakistan where Muslim boys and and Christian boys get to learn together. A school that provides revenue to help provide even more education for girls who are viewed as second class. Providing a way for children and young adults in that country to learn and change the climate in a land that seems as impossible as feeding a crowd of 5,000 with five loaves and two barley and two fish. Philip and Andrew, all the other disciples, were tested by this question of Jesus. Did they pass? How are we going to respond? Will we pass the test? Let us pray. Loving God, in your generosity, you shower us with hope. 
and gifts of love and blessings of all kinds. Help us in your name to share. Amen.